Right, so I'm Neelan Maria and my colleague Charles is also helping me present and we're from SKA South Africa and we do radio telescopes. Um, why radio telescopes? Well, simply you get to see a different part of the spectrum. On the left you can see an optical image and on the right a zoomed in copy of a false color radio image uh, of an interstellar hydrogen gas overlaid. And as you can see you can't see that on the optical image at all, so that's pretty neat. Uh, for more details, you should go and look up a video of a talk Simon Radcliffe gave yesterday, if it's online. Um, so, an optical telescope kind of looks like this. Light is collected by a large mirror, and then it's focused... Over this. Can I point to this? Oh. Timer? No. Oh, maybe this works. Right. So, you can see there's a, there's a mirror it reflected onto a sensor, and it's kind of like your digital camera, only better. An optical telescope, oh no, sorry, a minimal radio telescope looks like this. Radio waves are collected by a parabolic reflector and it's focused onto a receiving antenna with a low noise amplifier and it's really a lot like your DSTV uh, dish, just better. Right, it's much better. Um, but a single dish is still a rather limited kind of instrument. It's, it's almost like a single pixel camera. So what do we do? We use multiple dishes. Um, so a typical modern, well, a small typical radio telescope looks like this. Radio waves from multiple dishes are mathematically combined, and that allows you to image the radio, radio frequency sky, letting us make images like one you saw in previous slides. Okay, so we uh, we do controller monitoring, Charles and I and our other controller monitoring team colleagues, and what we're dealing with a telescope which is essentially made up of a large number of distributed and fairly independent devices. Uh, so CAM is the nervous system that pulls it all together. And uh, so the control bit is getting them all to work together to do what we want them to do. And the monitoring bit is receiving sensory feedback. Uh, they're like humans, you know, they have senses. And um, so, from that we can identify unsafe or damaging situations and take action as needed, like you can shut down stuff that's overheating or if the wind is blowing too strongly, you can put the antennas in a safe position. And we also monitor parameters that influence data quality. We also store the telemetry information, like the antenna positions, because um, the scientists later when they process the data will need to know exactly where the antennas are pointed at when they when the observation was made. And uh, remote operation is very important for us. We like to keep uh, stinky humans away from our telescope because we do stuff that emits radio frequency interference and that's our enemy. So uh, we network transparency is kind of an important thing and that's also why we can give you a live demo today. Right, so what are we dealing with now? It's CAT7. So CAT means Karoo Array Telescope and seven because, strangely enough, there are seven dishes. It's a conventional prime focus design, which means that, that receptor antenna... Oh, sorry, that was meant to happen. Go back, please. Listen to me. Yes. Yeah, so, the uh, receiving antenna is at the center of the antenna, as you can see. And um, what is unconventional is it uses a Stirling cryocooler to cool the low noise amplifier and it's constructed out of composites. Uh, it started being built in about 2008. It's pretty much done now and we're using it daily. However, it is main job is to be a, a risk reduction kind of engineering prototype for Meerkat. So it's, it's the hardware equivalent of release early, release often. Um, it's also used for science, but that's a secondary goal. Um, so we're working towards Meerkat. So it'll have 64 dishes, so more of everything. That's why it's mere as in more cat. It's uh, got a somewhat more advanced <laughs> antenna design. You can see we call this uh, feed low because the feeds are actually sitting close to the ground, which has a number of practical advantages. And there are also some performance advantages to this configuration. But the construction and the cryocooling is actually more conventional. Um, what's also nifty about it, it'll have a multi-band Maybe you can see it here. There's 
more than one feed antenna that can actually rotate in on a carousel to work with different frequency bands, which makes basically the instrument more capable capable of observing more different kinds of radio phenomena. Uh, preliminary construction is already started, and it m it's expected actually to grow into SKA phase one, which will be about 300 dishes. So let's look at a single receptor. When I say receptor, I mean the combination of a reflector, the anten uh, receiving antenna, physical motion control, and a whole bunch of radio frequency components that you need to actually receive a signal. So it's not just an antenna, but we often call them antenna. Right. So at the focus, we have the receiver horn antenna, which is connected to a low noise amplifier, which is cryocooled. And the cryocooler has an iron pump, which is not from Star Trek. It actually just keep, maintains a vacuum, which you need inside the cryocooler. It's got a uh, a noise diode, which we actually use for calibration, and another radio frequency amplification stage. And at the inside the pedestal, we have a position, a positioner, which actually moves the antenna. We have some more radio frequency stuff, and we have a radio frequency to optical transducer, which um, turns the electric signals into optical signals that we send along fiber optic to the central processing area. And uh, this little little block, uh, I keep pressing wrong, but that little block at the base of the antenna is a chiller unit which creates chilled water which is used to keep everything cool. And there's also building management which sounds kind of boring but one of important detail is that damn door has to be closed otherwise the radio frequency leaks out and it ruins the observation. And there's also close to the antenna is a weather station which we use for monitoring the wind and stuff like that. So. We have seven receptors, so basically seven of everything you saw in the previous slide. And yes, you might have seen this picture before. Okay, so those optical signals then all feed into a compute container. It's kind of a standard shipping container. But it's, got, it's RF, especially RFI shielded to keep all the radio frequency noise generated by um, our banks and banks of humming machinery inside. And um, it's kind of got kind of cool, it's got like airlock doors, you open the one door and then close it and then the other one, so you can actually go in while we're observing. Um, and uh, yeah, so keeping RF in is important. So inside there's a whole bunch of cool stuff, this is not all of it. Um, so let's see if I can show you this. You can't see it, but there's a, the RF to optical transducer, and then this thing basically, there's another rack at the bottom which is the same as the top receives the, the analog signals from all the, the dishes and it kind of mixes it down to a, a intermediate frequency which is what we actually digitize and um, then there's a the FPGA based digital backend so these are main component of our humming machinery inside of the biggest baddest FPGA chips you can buy and they crunch do kind of a first level of number crunching and here and these ones also have the analog to digital converters, which are actually quite monster. Um, and this is probably my favorite bit of equipment in the whole telescope. It's an at atomic clock that's GPS disciplined, because time is incredibly important to astronomy and radio astronomy in particular, because you actually need coherent um, clock signals all through the system. So below it is a little NTP server, and below that is a is an oscillator which generates an 800 megahertz clock used for the analog to digital converters, but it's it's kind of synced to the to the atom clock, so it's very stable and very very accurate. And there's again building management and a chiller. Right. So what are the principles of our controller monitoring system? So the most important thing is, as far as possible, everything speaks the same language. We have CATCP, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And we try and keep the things to be self, the system is kind of self-describing. We, we have a basic config, but then once that's set up, you can introspect the devices and see what they have and what they can do. Obviously, we don't expect them to change too often, but still it makes the software much simpler. Um, and we use the idea of soft real-time. So, which is actually kind of why we can use Python. So for time-critical commands, uh, for hard real-time operations, is left to the si simple low-level devices. So soft real-time involves us sending those devices instructions along with future data timestamps. And then the device with, with a hard 
real-time capability applies the command at the timestamp we, we gave it. So that's also why it's very important for our time sources to be synchronized. Um, but this simplifies CAM development significantly because I don't know if anyone's ever done hard real-time programming, but it's crazy. You have to know where what every instruction basically does. Um, it's not no way to live, <laughs> according to me. <laughs> and uh, well, mo most of that is kind of outsourced anyway. We, yeah. Okay. Right. So, Kourou Array Telescope Control Protocol, or CATCP, is really at the heart of our control system. It's uh, uh, we specify CATCP interfaces for all our devices, and when we can't get that, if a, if a contractor doesn't want to do it or can't do it, we kind of add CATCP interfaces ourselves. And this allows us to use standard mechanisms to control and monitor everything. For instance, we use Ganglia to monitor our, our servers, but we export certain metrics as CATCP sensors, and then we can use the same mechanism as the antenna on a fire sensor that will send us an SMS if a disk runs low, so it uh, just kind of unifies everything. CATCP is homegrown, as you might guess from the name, but some of our collaborating, collaborating partners in the US are using it. Uh, we experimented with some things before, it didn't quite work out, which is why we went to our, our protocol. So basic ideas, use Ethernet as a field bus, which also precludes hard real-time operation. And it's a very simple line-oriented text protocol which runs over TCP sockets. I'll show you an example now. And um, the idea of device introspection is part of the standard, which is, I think, pretty important. And there's also this idea of a sensor that you so the device can have sensors that exports temperatures or voltages or wind speeds or states. And there's mechanisms for subscribing to those sensors. Oh, right, so this is to remind you that I want to do a demo. Uh, let me first show you the source code. So this is how you write a very simple um, CATCP server. We import some stuff, a server and cat types module from CATCP. And these uh, decorators basically tell us what parameters, so no, the request basically tells us what parameters the, the request expects to floating point numbers and it will return a floating point number and then the actual function that implements it is quite simple this sock is supposed to be a socket object which you're not supposed to touch it really just identifies your connection um, but so it's quite simple I'll get to the sensor now but essentially you just return OK to tell it it's fine and the value that you want and then we have a sensor which will we use to count the number of times our request is called so every time the request is called, you can see here we get the sensor and you basically say the time it happened is now, the sensor is a, is, a, is a nominal value so the sensor is ok and we add a, we increment it. So now this is the code, and now we get to run it, which is the exciting bit. so I can do this. Sorry, a bit of housekeeping. Um, split the terminal. So now I'll run that simple server. What's the basic? That's it. And it'll listen on port 8000. And you can tell it to it. Oh. Not if you're an idiot. And it gives you kind of a welcome message. And now you can ask it things. So a request always starts with a question mark. And a useful request is a help request, which tells you something about requests. So I can say request help, divide, and the parameters are space separated. And you get back that uh, hash means it's an inform, which gives you extra information and it's in form for the divide command and that's the doc string we gave in Python comes in uh, as a help command as a help and there at the end is an exclamation which is a, a reply so every request question mark has a reply exclamation so basically we're always shouting at each other um, and it tells us it's okay and it returned us one help command I can introspect the device by saying help now this is a long list but basically you get you get uh, the same kind of 
request in a form. Oh no, this is not what I want to do. Please don't. Oh, there we go. So basically, you get the same request in a form lines for every 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 request that the device has, and that's how you can introspect it. And you can also say sensor list. You get a list of all the sensors, and you remember we defined the one sensor, so there's only one. Oh, the other requests are added by the base class, so that's like basic things like what I'll show you now. Oh, let's first run our request. Let's divide request one two, and you'll note it actually uses floating point division because we had the cat type saying it should be a float. And now we want to monitor our sensor, so we can subscribe to the sensor by setting a sensor strategy. Sensor was called no divides. And we want uh, an event strategy. So event means whenever. Oh. 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 I still can't type. After all these years. Right. So now every time we change that sensor, so if we run our request again. you see it, we get an inform line telling us that the sensor value is updated. So basically, in CATCP you have requests which are essentially synchronous and you have these kind of informs which can give you asynchronous information about what's going on in the device. So typically you'll subscribe to a bunch of sensors and then just sit back and listen to them for monitoring. Um, and it also gives us some free error handling, like if we do this, it'll tell us we need to give it some more parameters. Okay, so that's that. Now let's get back to the exciting stuff, which I won't be doing. Right. Okay, so back to the slides. Oh, sorry, this is uh, where... Um, where the press is quite wonderful. You can't actually bring a, slide, a slideshow to the forefront. <laughs> I can't do it. So, apart from the basic CATCP devices, we use a thing called proxies. They sit between the devices and the users. And uh, they, they basically shield the device from users. For instance, many of the devices are implemented as small kind of embedded processes and they can only handle one concurrent connection. So the proxy makes it possible for multiple clients to talk to the device. And we can also hide or wrap certain functionality of a client, of a, of low-level device. For instance, the digital backend, those uh, FPGAs have 16 channels, we only use 14. So the proxy can hide the, other two the sensors relating to the other two channels so we don't get false alarms about signal levels. And we can also add higher level functionality. For instance, the basic antenna control unit only knows how to point an antenna relative to its kind of base. But what astronomers want to do is they want to track sources as they move through the sky. So the antenna proxy is connected to a database of astronomical sources and then it will update the position of the antenna every 50 milliseconds so it's very smoothly tracking the object through the sky. And uh, similarly you can use it to combine multiple small devices into a bigger one which the antenna proxy which we should call the receptor proxy does. It combines all those devices I showed you initially that was on the receptor to look like it's just one device. Okay, and I think... Oh, right, so this is, I think, where uh, Charles comes in, right? And I think I'm a minute early, so you have a good time. <laughs>
Right. Um, okay, well, uh, Nilan's already mentioned the, the, the proxy layer. It, it uh, protects the hardware from foolish humans. It um, also allows us to, to, to buffer commands if necessary, uh, to aggregate uh, sensors, and um, generally to, to, to turn a a dumb hardware device into a slightly more intelligent software object that we can that we can uh, safely manipulate. Um, <coughs> we've also developed some higher level interfaces. Obviously, uh, doing this everything through through a telnet is, is not not an option. Um, so we've got an, uh, some IPython libraries that that uh, make life significantly easier. Um, and there's also a scripting interface for uh, batch type operations. Um, the whole system is designed for remote operation. Uh, it's, it's been designed from the start so that it can be operated from from um, Cape Town. And um, we do have people on site, but they um, are there for, for sort of local emer emergencies and for, for local uh, maintenance and so on. Um, the whole system is designed to be operated from uh, essentially uh, by the internet, by by astronomers anywhere. And um, maintenance can take place to a large extent from, from Cape Town as well. Um, so, where are we? Sorry. There we go. Uh, why do we monitor stuff? It's because the radio telescope is collect collecting this RF signal data, but um, it does need a bit more than that. Um, you need a context for it. And uh, the context includes things like where were the antennas pointing when you collected this data. Um, signals have to be combined and correlated, so we need, need to know exactly where all the, all the dishes were pointing at every moment. Um, there are also several corrections that need to be applied to to the pointing information because of uh, the distortion of the dishes, because of temperature and wind, um, also uh, because of the, the actual antenna layout. There are uh, a whole series of uh, mathematical corrections that need to be applied. Um, and the the raw data, which is which is um, fed through to the science processing, is actually augmented on the fly with well, sorry, not on the fly, but um, after the event with some this, con this context information so that it becomes possible to process it. Um, <coughs> another reason for, for monitoring is that we need to be aware of equipment trends, we need to be aware of equipment failures, um, weather patterns, and I think Neil mentioned that if, if the wind speed ex exceeds a certain threshold, the antennas must be stowed, which is um, I sometimes see them in a fully upright position. That's the safest configuration for them. Um, we have a system of alarms, which is activated when, for example, the temperatures of the equipment get too high. Um, if the cryo cooler fails, then uh, we need to know about that. Pedestal doors left open. Um, and, for example, if the radio frequency f uh, power levels become too high, um, in the in the amplifiers that we need to know because that that degrades signal quality. Um, so we monitor quite quite a lot of stuff at the moment. Um, on Cat Seven, we've only got seven dishes, and uh, we monitor about about three three hundred sensors um, at millisecond rates and 100 sensors at, at second rates. Uh, sorry, I seem to have a slight, slight disconnect here. Um, sorry, it's approximately approximately 260 sensors per antenna, um, and altogether 4,500 sensors at about 650 samples per second. That, that means that adds up to about a little less than 500 megs a day. Um, and uh, that's okay at the moment. We can store that information, um, but it's already getting to the point where it's a little bit annoying when you want to query historical data. 
um, it takes takes time to 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 read all that stuff, post across the network, and and render it at a at a client. So we're we're looking at ways of dealing with that, particularly as Meerkat is going to be 64 dishes. We're going to have uh, more servers, more sensors per antenna, and a whole lot more sam samples per second. So we'll get the the whole database is going to be growing at about 10 gigs per day, we think. Um, so, are we heading for trouble here? Uh, we need a, uh, an archiving design that's going to be going to be scalable and and quite efficient, particularly for 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 reading purposes. We think we have the the, the writing covered, but um, reading is something that that can be a little bit slow. So, um, I just want to talk about the sensors a little bit. Those are the as as Neilan said, there's, there's the base, basic data gatherers that are managed by by a proxy, um, and it's a sensor. It's a sorry, it's a sof software object. So we can do clever things with them. We can we can um, aggregate sensors into other sensors. We can average them over time. We can um, and because it's it follows an observer pattern. So we we just need to. Um, Subscribe to a sensor in order to in order to derive some useful information from it. For example, to to activate an alarm when necessary. Um, sensors can have many types, and they they communicate via CAT CP. Um, they can be float sensors, discrete sensors, Boolean sensors, or even string sensors, that, which are not generally sensors at all. They're, they're simply a convenient way of of um, Storing some configuration information that we, in a way that we can, we can look up. Okay, and we're going to need a lot, a lot more of those for Meerkat. Um, so, and of course, the next thing is is going to be uh, we're just looking at Cat Cat Seven in the in the slide there. I hope. Yep. Um, SKA is going to have roughly three thousand dishes ultimately. Um, SKA phase one will only have, have about 300, but that's already becoming a challenge for our current architecture. Um, one nice thing about our about our system is that the the proxies and the sensors are self-describing, partly as a result of that of the CATCP protocol. So the system can actually configure itself dynamically. Um, it greatly reduces the the load for um, the burden of of system configuration because you simply tell you which proxies to connect to. The proxies tell you what sensors you have, and the sensors tell you what their names are and what they can do. And um, <coughs> this makes for a very, a very um, flexible, uh, scalable system. Um, so it makes sorry we're getting to. Um, Looking at what Meerkat is going to produce, that's going to be around about five gigabytes a day, um, and relational databases don't work terribly well with that that kind of that kind of volume of data. Um, at the moment, we've got a, we've got a hybrid system. The index is stored in a relational database, but the the actual data is stored in compressed files, a proprietary format, I suppose. Um, <coughs> but we are thinking about some other other approaches. We are starting to look at pie tables, um, and uh, our query performance is, as I said, just about acceptable for now. But but I, uh, we think it's going to it's going to get worse uh, if we don't if we don't rework our architecture a little there. Um, <coughs> okay, now to move on to something slightly different. Um, Cat seven. Is producing science data, as you saw in that picture that uh, Neilan showed, and in, in this this one as well. Um, this is good and interesting stuff. But Meerkat is going to be a, a far more powerful instrument. In fact, it's going to be easily the most powerful um, radio telescope in the southern southern hemisphere. So we expect a lot of a lot of interest from the astronomers. So there can be a lot of activities and observations running simultaneously. Um, we need now 
up to now it's been a, pretty much an ad hoc process. You simply um, uh, send a message to say, I'd like, like to use the antenna now, and um, <coughs> you can reserve it that way. But um, with a bigger instrument and a lot more users, we need, we need a framework that's going to control the access and allow concurrent activities while preventing accidental resource conflicts. So we have a thing called the observation framework. Um, and the basic concept of the observation framework is schedule blocks. Um, schedule blocks have, are simply a way of um, structuring observations. Um, they can be observation type schedule blocks, which are scripted in Python. They can be manual, which is simply an IPython session. Um, and they can be of maintenance type, which is just simply a way of reserving, reserving the hardware so that it it doesn't accidentally get used for, for something else. Um, the astronomers at, at present are used to just running running the Python scripts, um, so we need to introduce the, the, the discipline of the of the schedule block, which will uh, make it necessary to, to to specify in advance what what resources you're going to use, and uh, <coughs> they're also going to be an important part of our proposal management tool and the observation planning tool, which are also bits of necessary bureaucracy which are going to have to be introduced um, <coughs> for Meerkat and, and particularly for SKA. Um, so for the fra obs observation framework components, um, we've got cat core lib, which contains, can, contains the routines that allow you to build a cat host, which is, cat host is just the high level container, which is the top Top level for our our um, software model, um, we the, the cat host container then contains the proxies, and the proxies contain um, not only their own operations but also usually a, a whole lot of sensors. Um, there's going to be a controller resource manager which uh, starts and stops the proxies and validates the schedule blocks. And it also allocates. There is a um, the resource manager component has has the role of allocating resources and reserving them for for use by a particular by a particular schedule block. The scheduler um, is going to manage a queue, um, and it's going to uh, as each as each schedule block becomes available and is duly validated, it will be submitted to the executor. Or the executor, <coughs> the executor. Um, runs the observation scripts. It's a, it's a slightly higher level um, controller. Well, uh, what should I call it? It's an executor. It runs scripts. It collects out, collects the output. makes makes the output um, available online during the during and after the the schedule block is executed. Um, okay. I want to do a little IPython demo. Um, just so that you could see what our okay, uh, except here yeah, I can't see it myself. Uh, right. Yes. Okay. Then I have to stand back here. Either, either if I put it down here. Sure. Sorry, it's experimenting. Um, okay, what we're going to do here is we're just going to, um, we have um, Okay, I'm not totally familiar with what this script has done so far, but we're going to Okay. All right. So what uh, what we're going to do is we're going to find <coughs> find a target in the in the catalog. So we could say um, target equals cat dot source. Um, sources.
which happens to be the same source that you saw in that um, earlier slide with the, the, the radio image. Um, let's verify that we actually do have a target there. Okay, <coughs> so now um, we need to set that target on, on an antenna. So we can go cat. That's a good idea. Okay. Uh. Okay, I'm slightly, slightly defeated by this old tab. Okay. There we go. Okay. Those are our telescopes. They're currently, currently all stirred. Um, and what we hope will happen now is that when we, when we get track, then just the antenna that we're instructing to track will, will move. So that's talking to the to the proxy. Um, the antenna itself is too dumb to know what a target is. Um, it only knows about azimuth and ele elevation. So we're talking to the proxy, and the proxy, as as we mentioned, uh, does know about about targets. Um, <coughs> so now we, we um, the next thing is the antenna mode has to be set. Oh, cute. And the brackets here, sorry. And I want to use round brackets. Apart from that, it's perfect. <laughs> hey! <laughs> All right. This is a real picture. Okay. It seems to have caused a, caused a panic on site. They're all rushing up to, to look at the antennas. Um, and there it goes. Okay, and while while we're doing that, um, we can go. Okay. Um. Sorry. Underscore ACS position. Now I was actually looking for an and was for antenna position. Uh CS. Request ASM will do. Okay, meanwhile the the sorry? P. So, sorry, being mad here. Yes, that's probably a better idea. Sorry, Q. Uh, 
print Let's try to auto. Yeah. Uh, well, strategy equals auto would do. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, I've got too many, too many of them, but. It's a little more manageable. As you can see, the the um, <coughs> azimuth and elevation do do change in real time, and you can you can subscribe to these sensors and see what and see what they're doing. Um, <coughs> right. Meanwhile, that what that one has got gone back to its has reached its tracking position, so it's it's now moving very gently, but a little too slowly for us to to, to notice. Um okay then finally I would like to show you um yeah our GUI um Right. This this is part of our, our graphical user interface. There's quite quite a lot more to it. Um, right now, it's in manual mode. This is the the, the scheduler. Um, this is part of the observation framework that I was talking about. Um, if I we have some um, observation schedule blocks ready here, which I need to show you. Okay, there's one. Um, if one selects a schedule block, you can, you can see the detail, the details over here. Okay, right now, um, if I put the queue, the scheduler into queue mode, then it will automatically queue that next schedule block, and we sh should see something happen there. So I'm going to do that. Um okay, I'd very much like to move this so that one can see a little more of it. There we go. Um yeah, right. Design for big screens. Okay, that, that demo track is now active. Um and if we I'll quick, we can get over to the um, okay, I can't see much happening there. Oh yes, okay, these these guys are moving. Okay, the reason that the ant ant one is not moving is that according to uh schedule blocks, ant one uh, sorry, that ant one is this guy in the I don't know if you can see my cursor, yes. Um he's in maintenance mode. Um according to the fa fake um, schedule block that we've set up here, which means that um, the observation framework can't control it. It's assumed to be out of out of operation. Um, however, the other ones are doing the business. <laughs> Sorry, except for the ones that are really in maintenance. Yes, which we unfortunately weren't allowed, not allowed to play with either. Um, <coughs> Okay, so we've we've now made made all the other ones move. Um, next step was yeah. Oh.
Okay, next step. Sorry. Uh, let me get you back to, to our GUI. Okay. The way to get this get this antenna back to life is to take the um, take it out of maintenance mode. And find my cursor. Right. Um, and done. Sorry, that is the is that the demo one? This one, yeah. Okay, so if we now we need to sorry, there we go. Okay, we've got the right one now. Okay, uh, because that's maintenance, all we need to do is, is say complete and it becomes available to the system again. So that that antenna is now is now available. Um, which means that something else I've not shown you so far because of the um I just okay, it's a, okay, it says it's ready ready is false because because it's actually started running immediately. Um There we go. And here it is. Swing, swinging over to join its colleagues. Sorry? Time's up. Okay, our time is up. I don't know if uh, there are any questions. But uh, I'm glad we got them to, to dance a bit. Thank you, guys. There definitely will be questions. Here's some. Um um, what's the benefits of having the azimuth mounts over equatorial mounts with the antennas? I'm sorry, the azimuth mount had? Over equatorial. Equatorial. Um, it's simply that uh, we have we have a lot of, a lot of flexibility um, in uh, positioning the, an the antennas because because the, the thing is entirely computer controlled. Um, we we can essentially do software control tracking. We don't need to have an equatorial mount which is which is basically a mechanical mechanical way of of aligning the uh, a telescope to to the to the rotation of the earth. Um, and a full as L mount mount gives you complete complete control in all in all axes. Um, when, once the you know, it's how it was seventy five percent of this the SKA is going to be in South Africa and twenty five in Australia. Um, are they going to function as a single unit, or probably not? Um, uh, the, a lot of that is still under under discussion. Okay, but because ch chance, chances are that there will there will be there will be some coordination certainly between between them, but um, it's going to be rather difficult to because the the data mixing. There would and be you watch an absolute nightmare. Uh, yes. Yeah. Actually, the SKA is is um, it's like uh, it's actually like three or four separate instruments. So the most visible one is the one that will use dishes and it will operate at kind of gigahertz frequencies, and then there'll be some other another instrument which operates at fairly low frequencies, like what you would use around for FM radio, and there'd be another one that's kind of in between. So those uh, different frequency band um, instruments are actually pretty much completely independent um, instruments, and so the complete instruments will be either in South Africa or either in Australia. So then, your atomic clock would be become quite important for um, knowing who would observe what at what time. If you wanted to use the, those data sets in concurrently. Yes, in order I to build up a more complex picture. I think it's essentially impractical to to, to, to use to use data sets collected in in Australia and in South Africa concurrently. If you want to comment on that, you I mean, actually, they they do that already. It's called the very long baseline interferometry, where they will have antennas that are thousands of kilometres apart. But it's actually you need to be much more careful to get it to work. 
firstly, as they are not very accurate time sources, which the atom clocks are. But they also, you kind of calibrate your instrument against well-known um, targets. So you'll do an observation with the two different antennas of a known source and then your actual target. And because you know what the known source looks like, you can tune, fine-tune the delays and whatever between different countries. But coming back to the SKA thing, that won't be an issue here. We won't, you, you really can't use those different antenna, different telescopes together because they, it's like, you can't use an infrared camera together with, with a visible light camera at the same time. It's like, you kind of, it's two separate things, right? So you draw one picture for one and another picture with the other and you can, can overlay the images later, but you don't, you know. But no, so by the time you get to that point, you actually know exactly where everything is. So that's Thank you guys. Unfortunately, I need to stop you. <laughs> um, thank you very much for, this, for the talk. And uh, I think some people will probably be contacting you in the passageways to ask you about making them dance. I think that should be the demo you do, like a sort of audio to dancing of them dancing. Show the, oh, you can go to www.ska.ac, like academic.za, and there you'll find a link to actually a very nice time lapse video of it's called Cat 7 Dancing the Night Away, something like that. So. Cool, thank you.